Um, could I invite staff to come to the table? I think that there are a few questions that have arisen uh, from that presentation that would be worthwhile addressing first. Um, one is the history with respect to um, the area-wide mitigation proposal that was put out, um, I'm afraid, 18 months ago. Um, is the long time before I arrived in this role, and I don't have the history um, on uh, the Port Hills, uh, it, not even as a, in my former life, because as um, Phil pointed out, it was the Honourable Ruth Dyson that was uh, has really been um, knowledgeable in this area. Um, and I want to get an understanding of uh, the, um, the relationship between uh, the offer on area-wide mitigation, the cost share agreement, because there is a provision in the cost share agreement for the Crown to um, share this cost, but it is by agreement, and I want to understand why why that agreement wasn't able to be reached, because I guess the presentation that we've just had is, well, it sounded like a good idea at the time, at the outset, but all it's done is delay the inevitable, the inexec, inexec, well, that really long-term drive to um, a, a conclusion that none of us really wanted. So, um, what's you know, I, I kind of want to understand how did we get to the position where people have pinned their hopes on on resolving the rockfall issues with protection measures um, to a point where it now feels like there is no choice. So is anyone able to shed some light on that in light of the representation we've just had? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so the, the, if we go back into the history, the, the issue of area-wide mitigation was investigated by the, by the Council and by the Crown. Um, the, the Minister ultimately, and there was a pr process by that, and that looked at um, the technical feasibility of where area-wide mitigation could take place. It also looked at the uh, financial feasibility. Uh, in the uh, conclusion, the Minister, and I've raised this before with Council, the Minister made the call that uh, he did not and would not support area-wide mitigation on the Port Hills. And the, the alternative that was established by the Minister at that time was to um, create the red zone on the Port Hills and to create the residential red zone buyout offer. The council um, resolved to become a party to that, and so um, based on the 2007 valuations for properties, the minister offered um, to purchase that. 50% would be funded by the Crown, 50% would be funded by the council. So that's been a, a program that's been in place since sort of July, August 2012. Um, but can, and I, can I ask this? The cost share agreement says that the parties agree that if a cost effective engineering solution can be identified and agreed by the parties which will reduce the life risk from rock fall and or rock roll so that Port Hills RR said is no longer applicable to that area, the costs of giving effect to the agreed solution will be shared equally between them. So if that was signed in June 2013, how come the Minister said it wouldn't happen in 2012? Okay. Well, yeah. so I, mean, I, can't, I can't answer what the cost share said because I, I've not... I haven't been involved in that aspect of it. But the policy that's been in place has been the residential red zone buyout offer. And as, as we understand it, over 80% of the properties that have been red zoned have accepted that offer on the Port Hills. The council subsequently um, resolved, I think, in December of that year to adopt the individual rockfall protection structure policy, which basically uh, indicated that the council, if someone could um, develop and demonstrate to the council's satisfaction that they could individually protect an existing house, the council would basically contribute its 50% of its buyout offer um, to that process. Um, now, that process has been, that policy has been in place, that policy has um, 
uh, a number of properties have gone through that, and we can comment on that directly. A large number of people have looked at that. But clearly, as has been explained before, the rockfall protection, individual rockfall protection structure policy is designed to comprehensively address the risk as we now understand it. So uh, the thresholds for that are, are high, um, and invariably some of the costs associated with that are high. In some instances, they're not, but in some instances they are high, and that's obviously influenced people in the choices they've made about either pursuing that those individual solutions or not. So, in, sum, in, in summary, the, re the response by the council, we believe, has been um, has been more than adequate. It has participated in the red zone offer, which was led by the crown, and it has continued to offer the individual rockfall protection structures to private individuals on application. Um, and, and that's the current uh, policy that we're operating. So um, would, would you agree with really what we've heard, which is that, um, or that really that we've, we've, been, we've been cut off from, from really making decisions that, that might have been available early on in the piece by the lack of contribution uh, of Crown land and the um, inability to access Crown land? Did we ever get a response to the request for access through... Uh, no, not on access through it, but, but my, my understanding is that, as always, the Minister has been open to the, the concept of access through Crown land to, buy the, uh, to build rockfall protection structures. Um, have so, we been... So, so it was just the decline for... To, to use the Crown land. To use, to use the land. land. Yeah, and that's um, been consistent with his yep. policy for some time. Have we been hamstrung? Um, I'd, I don't know that I would... Have, Agree with that. I think we've got to look at that in the whole. So he's been very clear that he won't. Um, he and, and I think this influenced his decision some time ago about why he refused area-wide mitigation. I think he was concerned with the residual liability that he bore uh, if it went on to uh, Crown land. I think he was concerned that. Uh, the advice he had at the time suggested that the solutions that were being offered weren't as robust as were being purported. Now, he, he made those decisions, not the council. Um, I think we also have to be very mindful that our overall, the overall policy position that we are in is actually not wishing to extend occupation of those areas or encourage occupation of areas of high hazard. So that's the discussion you've had as, a, as part of your role with the district plan. Yes, we want to recognise in instances where there's been existing or established occupation. There may be instances where people wish to retain that occupation and the individual rockfall protection structure is the appropriate response to that. Um, if, if Crown land was included in this, as you heard a number of months ago with our report, some of the benefit cost ratios would change. But until the Minister um, changes his mind and indicates that the Crown land may be available, then clearly that's not going to happen. Is there any opportunity within the context of the cost share agreement around um, seeking up to 50% of the adjacent land to um, uh, reserve land for, um, uh, you know, for, for, for our purposes as a council? Would that um, then get him, will get us over the line in some of the, in terms of some of the analysis? Because what that would do is that it would take away the risk that he appears to have, um, you know, uh, determined, uh, and obviously that the risk would transfer to us. But obviously we're we're seeing that risk at a different level. Um, we haven't specifically um, addressed that question to to Sarah or the minister at this stage. The principle, and again, I've, I've, as I've explained to Council before, the principle for where the 50% came from was actually around uh, improving access to um, reserves. So the 50% was really around saying uh, we wanted to be able to take back some of that Crown land on the basis of um, making logical extensions to reserves, creating access points to reserves. I think that... Um, that was certainly in the intention in, in the 50% sort of um, trade-off option. Um, it would be an interesting and moot point to see whether the minister would actually uh, countenance um, selling count or 
giving land back to the council if it wasn't for that purpose, even oh. if it was the 50%. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul? If the source of the uh, issue, in other words, where the, where the hazards actually uh, originate, is on our land, have we not got some sort of responsibility through that, uh, that for providing that risk? Well, you, you would have seen the you would have received um, some weeks ago the confidential report on on the legal position that we have. We know that the legal position is complex, but you will have seen the advice which believes that um, we are not um, we are not liable in in every case for every rock that could come down. So we believe that uh, we're not in general liable in that in that way. But you would have seen that report, and that's in PX. Uh, Yanni? Um, so, so noting that the cost share is different to the... The signed version of the cost share is different to the report that went to council, which was all land, not 50%. Um, but given that the cost share makes it really clear that if we identify areas where there's a cost benefit, regardless of who owns the land, that that is something that we can go back to the Crown with. Why haven't we done that work? Well, I actually think the, the Mayor answered that question to you a couple of weeks ago, and that is that the cost ultimately requires the agreement of the Minister no, no, that, and the Mayor. And, and we've, so we've had the advice the Minister won't agree that, to that. No, no, that's, that's actually different. The cost share, to change the cost share, requires the agreement of um, the Council and Government. What I'm saying is what we've currently got on the cost share. So we're not talking about changing the cost share. We're not talking about doing anything no, no, different no, I than think what was that, I think that I have actually said that. It states the parties agree that if a cost-effective cost engineering solution can be identified and agreed by the parties. So it actually has to be agreed by the parties, which will reduce the life risk from rock fall and or rock roll so that Port Hill's residential red zone is no longer applicable to that area. The minister stated on the record that he will not change the residential red zone um, and the costs of giving effect to the agreed solution will be shared equally between them. So that so, has to be agreed. Yes, but if, if we haven't done the work to go to the minister to say um, this is something that we believe is cost effective and reduces the life risk. So he might still turn around and say, no, sorry, um, that, won't, that won't do it and we don't agree with the assumptions you've made. But if we've got assumptions that back up the case that it, it was put in 2012, that the life risk is being reduced, that it is cost effective, surely we should get that information and present it to him first, rather than say, well, theoretically, do you support us doing anything around the land that you've already got? Because it seems like we haven't even made the case. We haven't done the work to make the case to seek his agreement. We have asked him if he will change his position on um, area-wide mitigation, and he has told us no, and he won't give us access to his land. So, I mean, the, the answer has been given to the question. We have asked him. There's no point going to the Crown with a proposition if, we haven't, if we've already been told the answer is no. I mean, what I cannot understand is why the cost-sharing agreement Agree, um, has this provision within it when it was patently obvious that the Crown had already decided not to go down the pathway of area-wide mitigation. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And I think, I mean, it might be worthwhile asking why that particular provision was included in the cost share agreement, because it has raised a level of expectation amongst councillors. I mean, the, the trouble is, is that the cost sharing agreement was not public before um, before the last um, local body elections. I mean, even the councillors that, that sit around the table today that voted um, to um, accept it or voted in the resolution, um, <laughs> against the resolution to accept it, um, the, the, they had not seen the documentation, so they didn't know, other than they had a provision in a cabinet, in a council report that said that this was going to be part of the deal. Is that right? Yanni Johansson knows this back to front. So yeah, It was a lot wider than that. It basically just said that the um, fi final binding cost here will reflect the council's current position, I think, around the, the, the rockfall. Um, so for some, for some reason, once this has become public, it has created a public expectation that the Crown would be 
the, you know, would, would receive such a request. But we went back to the Minister, I think it was um, identified in the May report. We had a meeting with him and he said no. Mm. So, I mean, we have actually raised it with him again. Ali. Just ask for clarification, please, around the <clears throat> point that Phil raised saying that with rockfall mitigation and proposals to mitigate on land, one application's been approved according to him, but the council says three. I just well, wanted. Peter can answer. Um, an application for 14, the Crescent, has been approved. For 16, the Crescent has been approved. The application was put by the, both property owners together. And we've been told that the application for 62 Horatani Valley has been approved. And we are talking to another seven or eight property owners um, about applications that they are working on to put in. No, it's not my understanding. Um, Phil? Can I just clarify in terms of individual um, Rockfall solutions that have, have all of the um, people, residents who've been involved, have they all been able to have um, clarification about op options anyway of, of um, individual mitigation? And that yeah, so I think um, we'll get um, Ian to answer you on that because, in fact, um, in every case, in our opinion, there's been strong interaction by our staff. It has been focused on trying to resolve people's issues. But as I said at the outset, these are complex structures. And so sometimes they, um, the answers aren't always um, agreeable to people. But perhaps Ian can comment on the interaction they have. So you mean, Mike, that they have been discussed? With, with oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yep. I've been involved in a number of discussions from people ultimately looking for a technical solution. So they've obtained individual ge geotechnical advice, come in to see us to see whether we think it's appropriate, and then seek our clarification on the pre-application funding. Not all of those have proceeded, and my understanding is that's not from technical perspective, it's from things like insurance. What's the point of doing this if you're not gonna get insured, etc.? So people are making decisions based around that. Um, but from a technical perspective, I've, I'm not aware of any application, or certainly it's done that I've done, is that we've actually refused them on a technical basis. We've actually approved uh, on technical grounds all the ones that have basically come in. Not all of them have um, proceeded to a final application, but there are a lot of reasons for that. And, and presumably that's because the, the, um, the plans say that, other, that the residents might have had when they haven't been agreed. Is that, in your view, they haven't been sufficiently strong to to so, meet the stand standard? So from a technical perspective, every time the geotech consultants have come to see us, we haven't actually returned them back. So we go through a robust peer review process that looks at it, if it's not going to reduce the, the hazard or the life risk acceptable, the, the theory is that they'll get sent back and redesigned. To date, we have not had any of that. All the ones that have come in have actually gone through the peer review and we've said it's technically feasible, it all fits the design and were to be completed, we would uplift the 124 notice. Thank you. Can I just ask you a wider question too? Because like there was, um, Phil Wilm, you made a comment about the um, peer review. And I just wondered, in fact, like, was it, what, why was it not some consideration of price? Or perhaps you can tell me um, differently. And the other part too was whether or not it included a methodology. And if it didn't, why it didn't? So the, the, the peer review was scoped to, to review the, the, the work that we had done. And it's important to understand the work we've done is at a conceptual level. In no places was there a detailed design done where it, for any of these area-wide. It was a concept to answer some very basic questions. Is it technically feasible? Is it financially viable? And under that framework, um, we asked Golda, who's, who's probably got the most ex expertise locally with the involvement in the gondola, certainly in the costing and the costing blow-ups that were involved, potentially, um, to, to look at our, basically, uh, the structure of our report. But it, it's important to emphasise that they were done on a concept basis. There's no detailed design for all the design parameters that anybody can start picking holes in, into an individual basis. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the um, cost-benefit analysis? Um, if, as um, Phil said, the um, Crown-owned properties were included in the calculation, would any of the 
would any of the area-wide mitigation um, solutions fall within a cost-benefit analysis that we would, we would accept? Um, so can I just rephrase the question? Of yep. the, the, are you suggesting if, if Crown land was incorporated as um, for the purpose of restoring houses on that yeah, land. Say, say, for example, that, that it hadn't been sold to the Crown. So say they were all individual property owners and they all wanted to be part of remaining there. Would the cost-benefit analysis have been sufficient for us to be signing off on the area-wide mitigation? Um, I think we'd, we'd have to go back and, and calculate that. Certainly, I think you've done the calculation. In, in principle, if you add more properties in, you are invariably going to, um, the numbers will change, but particularly if you start to grow the extent of the properties, yeah. and obviously you have to increase the volume of protective works. But yes, um, so we, we did a, a, a little bit of work to look at that, um, and it does does shift some of the BCs, but if it really does depend on where you draw the outer edge of the properties that you're going to be uh, including. But invariably, the more properties you add, probably the, it, in, in principle, it would tend to make the thing more affordable. So Phil was right that at the beginning of the process, the um, potential for the cost benefit um, to stack up in favour of remaining um, or area wide mitigation, that the cost, yeah, that at the beginning of the process it would have been higher than it was at the end, and that there's a certain degree of inevitability about what's where they've ended up and it's really just over this period of time of people giving up and selling their properties to Sarah? Um, well, arguably, yes. I mean, the, most, the, most, the time at which it was perhaps the most affordable would have been back in 2012 when the red zone, the, the red zone offer hadn't been um, presented. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Glenn. Thank you. I was going to ask uh, that first question too, but I, I had another one about... I appreciate the, the peer review... Uh, firm as local has experience, but just how confident are you that that peer review was independent? Oh, we're very confident that was independent. Yes. Uh, Yanni? So, um, accepting, I mean, I don't accept that we shouldn't do the work around the Crown owned properties, but accepting that that hasn't been done and the reasons for it because of the Minister, given the Minister hasn't made an offer to people with bare land. Uh, why have we not included bare land as part of our calculation, or have we? Um, I think that, I mean, it's a, a very good question because it actually goes to the heart of the principle. One of the things that we don't want to be doing is encouraging additional development in areas of high hazard, and people who have bare land have not occupied that. So if we allow new houses to go in there, we're actually introducing new people to levels of risk. So that's why we've, we've excluded bare land. If we, if we included bare land... How, how long would that process take? How do you mean to calculate that? Yeah. Well, I mean it, it's a calculation, and you'd do it, you'd put a nominal value on a return on a property, but it would to, to introduce that in, in my opinion would be contrary to the policy position council's taken on new housing on the Port Hills. So, and maybe that's a good a good time to sort of kind of switch to the district plan review and the recommendations that we uh, signed off on. Do, do you want to kind of update on that? Perhaps Helen could just yep. update on where the district plan provisions are. So, so just stepping back, the, the district plan review follows the, um, the Chris Massey, Tony Tague paper that was referred to earlier in terms of taking a risk-based approach. And so for the, um, for the Port Hills, we, we have got a non-complying activity for Rockfall uh, in the high hazard areas. So anybody who, that doesn't, that doesn't prohibit building, obviously it's non-complying rather than prohibited, but it does set a very high bar. So if anybody wants to put any residential development up there, they would have to demonstrate that they had uh, mitigated that risk sufficiently. The other thing to note about the, um, the district plan and the natural hazards chapter, and you may recall from when the, when the district plan was presented to you, the, there is a, a very high level of engagement from the public in terms of the need for policies to control development and restrict development where there are high hazards. And the survey results indicate over 80% 
agree that we should control where development is and we should clearly indicate what land is affected by hazards. So there's, there's, a, there's a broad community feeling on this that, that also has to be balanced against those individuals who, are, who have existing houses um, and, and need um, bespoke solutions, as it were. Could you um, speak to the existing use rights issue that um, Phil raised? Yes. If, um, in terms of the district plan, the, the new, if, if, if your house is within one of these new hazard management areas that has been, been mapped, um, those rules do not apply to your existing house. So if you can live in that house and you can maintain that house, but you cannot extend that house or build a new house on that property. So you can't intensify the use, as it were. Right. And so that would be the same for bare land in the area? For bare land, if there's no house I mean, on it... There would be no existing use rights, obviously. There would be no existing use rights, but, but, and so that would But it would be subject consent. to a very high bar in terms That's of um, being able to build there. Yep. That's right. But if there was area-wide mitigation that applied to the area, I mean, I mean, I, I'm hearing that there's, I mean, it's a, in a way, it's a tension between those that want to remain and the cost of um, achieving the sufficiently safe environment for that to occur um, over the, um, the, the the wider um, societal costs, I guess, of having. Um, people exposed to that de that degree of risk. That's right. So if if the if there is a rockfall protection structure in place, say, or a proposal for a, an area wide rockfall protection structure, that that doesn't make residential permitted because there is still a residual risk. Okay. So you, in terms of in terms of um, in terms of risk, removing people is is the most effective. That 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 is safe mm. then because the people aren't then exposed to the hazard. Um, a rockfall protection structure simply mitigates the, the yeah. risk, okay, so it reduces the risk, but the hazard remains and, you know, if there's an event above the design of that rockfall protection structure, uh, then obviously it, it, it may fail. Um, so it's not, it's not, people are not completely protected and safe, there's a residual risk. Mm. So if there was a rockfall protection structure in place, building on that bare land would still be subject to resource consent but it would be a discretionary activity rather than a non-complying activity. So the bar would not be so high. Thank you. Um, Yanni? Just two further points I wanted to get clarity on. One is um, the, re the request for clear guidelines from MB over rockfall protection structures. Mm -hmm. Have they issued clear guidelines? Uh, when, it, when did they come out? If they haven't come out, yeah. when are they coming out? And where do they apply to? OK. Maybe I can seek some clarification. Council developed um, the Rockfall Protection Guidelines um, in-house. Um, those guidelines have followed will uplift a 124, so there's been no impediment to actually stopping people do it. The issue with the majority of 124 um, properties in the, the Port Hills is either the hazard's too large to mitigate or it's because it's on a third property land. So it's not necessarily a technical reason. Um, the guidelines are, have been appropriate from a technical level. We have lately, um, it's always been council's position that uh, we shouldn't be doing guidelines, that if they're under the Building Act, they should be MBs. We have um, been trying to engage with MB for a while, and lately, within the last couple of months, we've actively um, handed over those guidelines, and the MB are basically taking them on, and they will. Um, basically adopt what we're saying with a couple of minor changes. They will probably move to a hazard-based approach rather than risk, so you don't have to calculate a risk. You just need somebody to say there's a hazard there and you need to mitigate it and this is how you do it. That's, nothing's different from our guidelines in that respect. It's just that either whether GeoTex says the problem's too difficult, we can't mitigate it, it's too costly, etc., or you need that person's permission to do it. It's on somebody else's land and that's not forthcoming. Those are the main reasons why 124 notices have not been uplifted, not because there's a lack of guidelines or a way forward. It's just the situation in the Port Hills. Also, uh, on cases that they're overturning S124s that we've issued if they're using the same guidelines? Oh, they, don't, sorry, they don't follow our guidelines. They run an independent approach from independent geotechnical engineers. And so they will get a, um, a variance of the geotech story. 
what is clear is that where there's been a, um, a determination and they've uplifted the 124s, it's been pretty much on the margin of the Rockfall energy. So it's debatable and it comes down to, dare I say, which model you use, etc. So it's in the vagrancies or the uncertainties of Rockfall. But I would say is that if you do get it wrong, the implications of a Rockfall are pretty drastic and that's my concern. Okay, and then the second question I had was around wh why did the peer review not look at the methodology that was used? They, they did look at the methodology. What I'm saying is that the methodology employed was a concept study, so we did not run site-specific investigations, rockfall analysis for all these concepts. They were merely concepts based on the available information. As you probably know it, all these areas are, tend to be very site specific and have site specific quirks to actually try and get information to go one step further into an actual design process would be a, a, a timely and very costly exercise. So we basically asked some very simple questions. Is conceptually, is it possible to, to protect these areas? If so, how would we do it? What are the broad parameters we're going to use in those assumptions? And then we'll pin some finances onto it. So to say it was like a pre-feasibility concept, there was no detailed design done in it. But there would have been methodologies and assumptions made. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that they have been peer reviewed. Yep. Okay. So can I just uh, also draw your attention, because the question of 124s and application by MB and their determinations did come up. So there is quite a detailed section in the report. Uh, as you'll know, in section four, which looks specifically at those few instances where determinations have been given, and then, uh, as you will know, there have been one or two instances. How many instances where the, the determination two have been overturned, um, and in a number of cases, um, the ones um, council decisions have been upheld. So um, that is, as as explained in the report, on a very site by site. Um, Basis and I think Councillor Hanson, you also specifically asked around, um, I think, um, Pinsabi Araroa, what, why some properties were, what, why one property was um, overturned and, and yet 124s remain on properties around and below that, and we've covered that off as well.